probably uh, for one patient, it would just be the follow-up uh, lab work that we have that I can either share. The, or just the goal generally is for the the report clinical synopsis to tell the story up until uh, and explain why the biopsy was taken. So if you know. Sometimes that that works as a as a template for the discussion of the of the events that led to the miles. Right. Well, hopefully, if I've filled out the forms well enough, uh, hopefully I should have done that at the time of admission. So um, probably not too much uh, additional information then. It's up to you. I can pull up the the written that you have. Uh, for Teddy, do you want to start with Teddy or do you want to start with Sir Francis? Uh, I think we can talk with Teddy. Uh, we can start with Teddy just because it, that one should be fairly short, um, certainly shorter than I think Sir Francis will be. Um, so uh, for, I think, Shelley and Larry, um, they've heard me talk about this case before. Um, this was a, a young dog, about a three-year-old dog that was presented to us with what seemed to be fairly acute onset of azotemia and proteinuria and was sent to us actually for dialysis. We didn't actually dialyze it because the dog was actually doing a little bit better and I think iatrogenically was made worse with uh, aggressive fluid therapy. We biopsied the dog because I was worried the dog might have underlying glomerular disease as the underlying cause of the azotemia. So we had the dog in the hospital for a few days before we biopsied it and um, sent the, uh, the information to you guys. I think the highest creatinine that was observed prior to biopsy was a creatinine of 7.1, although uh, the numbers were a little bit better in our hospital prior to submission. Um, the dog was, um, was hypertensive, and, but that had been controlled after starting amblodipine therapy. Um, and, and for as, as much as we could determine, the dog was otherwise healthy for the prior three years of his life and then very acutely developed lethargy, vomiting, anorexia about five days prior to biopsy. 24 hours after the onset of those clinical signs was evaluated by a veterinarian and found to be azotemic, hospitalized, was fairly oligoanuric, and became hypervolemic and was sent to us uh, luckily, we didn't have to dialyze the dog and um, biopsy it and put an e-tube in it um, as part of its management. Um, and so uh, we got the biopsies. Again, they're excellent cores. Um, and we uh, see what Um, so the key point um, of looking at this particular case is the um, uh, marked hypercellularity of the glomerular tufts. So sometimes they're even hard to pick out because they're just this ball of cells that are kind of almost intermixed with interstitial inflammation. So um, as you kind of scroll through the core, um, it's, it's really even hard to find good blood-filled glomeruli just because they're so hypercellular with nucleated cells instead. So all of these um, guys that I'm going by are, um, are, are glomeruli with this extreme hypercellularity. And so um, everybody knows I hate the um, h &E. So we'll move to better. And Ready. So on the PAS, um, glomeruli are a little bit easier to, to, to pick out in this stain. Um, and it's kind of an interesting thing, which is going to tie in a little bit with the um, uh, electron microscopy, but the um, glomerular tufts have a lot of cells with inside capillary lumens. Get my arrow up. So they're hanging out inside the capillary lumens, and here's our capillary wall right there. Um, and so all of these cells are inside the lumens, and there's also some degree of mesangial hypercellularity. And then the actual capillary wall, this tiny thin line, is actually still the glomerular basement membrane. So in general, 
the capillary walls aren't very thickened yet. Um, there's a few areas where you could argue there's double contours, but many of the capillary walls have a normal um, uh, thickness. And as I teach my residents, the best thing to compare the GBM to is the TBM. So as long as they're in the same kind of um, thickness level for a healthy TBM, tubular basement membrane, then um, we think that this is an acceptable thickness for a capillary wall. So um, hypercellularity, there's just a pitch of remodeling, but not, um, not every single capillary loop is remodeled. And we have this kind of dense nuclear debris, which is probably nuclear pycnosis, um, carioreccess. Um, and we see that kind of um, carioreccess debris in really bad um, MPGN patterns. So I think I texted um, JD as, we, uh, as I was at um, the uh, hospital conference that week. Um, at the med school, and we were looking at an MPGN case at the med school, and so I kind of texted them some pictures of this particular case, and then our discussion that was on a whiteboard at the med school. So um, I was very suspicious it was going to be immune complex mediated. I'll show you the silver just so we can look again at the remodeling. That is only segmental. So. Um, the, the capillary loops, again, we're just seeing this thin, um, delicate capillary loop, um, and it's very uh, uh, uncommon to see the um, remodeling that would be suggestive of a, very, of, of a, of a more long-standing injury. So um, I was pretty sure that whatever was happening, it was fairly acute, um, and I wasn't sure, um, you know, it, it, it seemed like a proliferative GN with some segments of remodeling, so I put it into an MPGN pattern, but uh, I think even now, looking back, it's probably more of a proliferative GN and not necessarily a membrano-proliferative GN, um, but either way, I think I was pretty confident there were going to be immune complexes, so I'll pull up the, um, um, actually, I'll pull up the PowerPoint. So what was interesting for this particular case was that um, the, the uh, ITG actually wasn't very strong. I don't know how many glomeruli I had in this particular sample, but the, the IgG was really, was really kind of uh, uh, weak, trace to weak. Um, and then the C3, it always is difficult to look at a picture versus looking at the actual thing through the microscope in a dark room. But the C3 was stronger than the IgG. It was still probably 1 plus, and the IgG was trace. Um, and I can look and actually see what my, my, my official scores were. The official scores, oh, I'm looking at the wrong case. Hold on one second. My official scores for immunofluorescence were that the IgG, um, oh, actually, I kind of gave it a little bit stronger for the IgG, so it, it might be that the picture is not doing it justice. Um, but the C3 was uh, at least 2 plus moderate, and the IgG was 1 to 2 plus, so it was a little bit weaker than the C3. Um, and again, George probably can attest to the fact that the pictures never do the justice to what you're looking at when you're looking at it through the scope. So. Uh, they're there, but it, it just wasn't as strong as when you're looking at it in a dark room. And the EM was very interesting in this case, and I think that's kind of one of the reasons we wanted to discuss it, is that um, a lot of the capillary loops in this particular case uh, were of normal thickness, so I'm following along the glomerular basement membrane. Um, we still have some pretty viable podocytes out here with good foot processes. And all of this would be inside a capillary lumen. Here's our GBM coming back. So all of this is in the capillary lumen. This is a red blood cell. That's a red blood cell. This is just a cellular fragment. Um, these are probably electron-dense deposits right in there, but they're very small. Um, and again, very, very, um, oh, wait, hold on. I'm looking at the wrong one. Never mind. Sorry, JD. That was my problem. I was like, this doesn't make sense. One second. So here's JD, here is uh, Teddy's case. I apologize. 
Okay, so again, we still have the um, hypercellularity in the capillary loop, and here is our GBM, but like I said, it is still fairly normal thickness. Um, it's going all the way around here. And what's cool about this case is they have these really large electron-dense sub-epithelial um, uh, humps. And we use the word hump because they look like a hump. And uh, there's not a lot, there, there's very minimal reaction of the glomerular basement membrane to the presence of this material. Um, and so uh, here's a higher magnification. They're just kind of sitting, plopped on the top of the GBM. Oftentimes in humans, when you see these humps, um, it's uh, um, a indicative of more complement uh, aggregates of complement proteins as opposed to aggregates of immune complex deposits. So all of these would be kind of similar to what we see with the C3 um, uh, uh, deposits um, in a human with, you know, humps of that, that material. So, and they like to sit right here in the neck of the mesangium and the capillary loop. So here all of these are humps. So they're, um, we're quite uh, scattered throughout the glomerulus. Um, and then even so, we still have a little bit of subendothelial material as well. So that would be a more of a subendothelial deposit. Um, and then I think when the um, second glomerulus in this group, I got really excited when I see this because we don't really see this in veterinary medicine very often. Um, in the second glomerulus, it's actually more of a straightforward subendothelial immune complex deposition. So the humps aren't um, present in the second glomerulus. They're more um, commonly within the subendothelial or mesangial zone. So, um, and this is just to show that there's even circulating granulocytes within the capillary loop. So this was a, a, an unusual appearance to um, this particular case. Um, and I, I think it was still mostly immune complex deposition um, on the subendothelial zone and then the presence of the humps being the atypical um, lesion. What's weird about like a post, uh, um, a um, post-infectious GN in humans, which often has humps in humans, um, it's weird because even though that's um, supposed to be mostly complement with little immunoglobulin, um, and it's sitting on the abluminal or the outside surface of the capillary loop, um, it still is quite a proliferative process in those glomerular tufts. So you'll see tons of polys, tons of kind of cellular debris, kind of like what we're seeing in this particular case. So even though the deposits are kind of sitting far away from the capillary lumen, I think the fact that there's so much complement there is what's bringing all of these inflammatory cells um, into the capillary loop. So um, an unusual um, uh, GN, um, and it uh, um, has evidence of some degree of um, subendothelial deposits, but then having um, C3 dominant um, humps uh, on the electron microscopy. Um, I don't know if any, I don't think there are any other anatomic pathologists on this list. Doesn't look like, um, George, we, I don't think we were, you ever really saw this as you were going through the service before I joined, right? Okay. Um, I, of course, you have worked with uh, physician nephropathologists way more than I. And uh, and the little bit that I did when I first got interested, I would go to their meetings and go to their training and things like this. And I would uh, hear about uh, post-infectious glomerulonephritis and was always sort of interested in what. But but you're correct. I don't recall. I've got a good memory. It's just short, but so I may be not remembering everything. But I don't recall ever seeing one that I recognized at the time or anyone else pointed out to me. What was a good candidate to be a dog equivalent of post-infectious uh, GN, um, but uh, th this one strikes me as a candidate. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the uh, because I we didn't see it so much, um, I, I never really studied it. But there is, for instance. Uh, a, a book that I rely on a lot called Primer on Kidney Disease. I have the fourth edition open in front of me. It has a whole chapter about post-infectious GN, and and, and uh, it's I haven't I just opened it, so I haven't read it. But um, you know, there are some 
dilemmas even for physicians in understanding exactly yeah. how it is and how it works. But the, the, my thought about it is that the, not that any glomerular disease is good, but I, I, I'm of the understanding that this is a relatively good you know, glomerular disease to be as bad as it is at the worst of it because it's highly reversible. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, even one of my veterinary colleagues at A&M back in the 80s had a, had a child, a daughter, teens, you know, early 20s that had this as a diagnosis and she got well. Uh, and, um, and again, I don't know all the particulars, but, but, but uh, the proliferative component is, is something that can go away. And remember that a lot of the GBM, as, as Rachel has pointed out, is, is fundamentally not all that altered. So if, it, 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 this is a healable lesion, I think. Yeah, I think what, what was uh, always kind of um, frustrating about this disease on um, when I was at UNC was that you would get the clinical history. So, you know, has, it's inferengetic, so it, or it's at the same time that they have, you know, a respiratory problem. Do you know that there's, uh, you know, the, the risk factors there? You see the proliferation on light microscopy. On IS, it does seem to be C3 with very little or less IgG. It seems to be a C3-rich uh, glomerular um, staining. And then you get to electron microscopy and you get to see the humps and the humps are really exciting and you're like, this is the classic one. And then eventually, um, you know, you go to another glomerulus and you start to see um, sub, you know, oh wait, this looks more like a sub endothelial deposit. And I think in, in the setting, because the physicians are so familiar with the clinical context of this, the physicians are fine, like, oh, well, that's fine. That's just in the background. Those deposits aren't going to, it's not, you know, it's not a, um, a, a, a disastrous MPGN process. So I think that sometimes, you know, even though the textbooks say you should just have humps, um, they will let the presence of some immune complex or some subendothelial electron dense deposits, and they could still be complement. I don't know if they're complement rich or IgG rich, um, but they just kind of ignore those because what they're so familiar with the clinical picture of you have this check. You have that proliferation check. You have minimal alteration of the GBM check. And then you have the clinical context, and so they're fine with that diagnosis. Um, and then who knows what ends up happening with these cases is eventually will it just smolder out and it'll go away, or will it completely return to normal? So um, is it, and I think this dog is improved, right, J.D.? The dog is actually doing uh, fantastic. We started the dog hey. on mycophenolate at about seven mix per kg twice a day just because of the dog's body weight and tablet size. And we did, I think, three days of steroids uh, in the beginning to, uh, to try to load the immunosuppression. The dog is clinically doing fantastic. The creatinine has come down, I think, 1.5, um, either 1.5 or 1.6. Uh, the UPC is now down to 0 0.8 when we last checked, which was about two weeks ago. Oh, wow. But was there was there an infectious uh, context in the in the history? Not that we can uh, easily identify. Nothing clinically. The initial infectious disease testing was negative. Lepto testing was negative. Urine culture was negative. Uh, we haven't repeated titers at this point to look at convalescent um, uh, uh, antibody levels. But there wasn't a uh, thrombocytopenia or uh, things that could have made us think that the, oh, this was maybe a rickettsial infection or something like that. So what, it's what still about white count? Was his white count elevated at all? Uh, I don't think so. Um, bear with me one second. I can tell you. But I don't think that it was. Um, so Rachel, would they use uh, immunosuppression in these or would they use in some kind of infectious uh, protocol to manage these patients? My impression, and George has the book open, but uh, is that they, they treat the underlying infection and this should kind of resolve. The, the other possibility... They're usually post-streptococcal or something, aren't they, typically? Yeah, yeah, well, let, more, let, let, me, yeah. let me interject. Uh, I have the book open. First of all, it's a clinical book, not fundamentally a pathology book. But in the chapter uh, about this, the section on pathology, it uh, starts by saying the glomerular lesions found in post-infectious GN fall into three patterns, 
acute endocapillary exudative GN, endo plus extracapillary, that is crescent, crescentic GN, and MPGN. And then they go on, he talks about the, 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 and they have pictures of pathology. Uh, etiology and epidemiology goes on to that. A, a table listing infectious agents associated with glomerulonephritis. Uh, there's about a dozen bacteria, strep, staph, pseudomonas, enterobacteria, salmonella, meningococcus, uh, treponema, brucella, leptospira, yersinia, rickettsia, and legionella, and viruses, hepatitis B, C, echovirus, adenovirus, cytomegalovirus, enteroviruses, Epstein-Barr virus, measles, mumps, parvovirus, rubella, SV40, and varicella. So, I mean, the, and that's people. So it's not, yes, it's it, the, the, the sort of textbook prototypical, you know, uh, example is uh, post-streptococcal, but it's not limited to that. And, and another chapter, another heading in the, in the discussion of this is the complex issue of post-infectious glomerular inflammation. I mean, so it, I mean, it's not simple. <laughs> I haven't read it all, but um, so it, uh, and in the treatment, there's three paragraphs. Um, I'm scanning it, and I'll tell you what I. Well, he's looking at that, J.D. Did the dog get antibiotics? We did give the dog a course of doxycycline. It, I think it received uh, four weeks of standard therapy doxycycline. Um, so it did re receive that, but that was the only antibiotic it was sent home with. It did receive, when it was hospitalized, I believe, either intravenous ampicillin or unison while it was in the hospital. Um, we had discontinued that after we had the negative urine culture and the negative lepto testing that was back. So maybe about a week's worth of a, a amino penicillin and then um, the month of doxycycline. And I'm sorry, you said that you did infectious disease testing beyond lepto. Oh, okay, what was it again? Did you include uh, that one? Um, I need to go back. I don't think so. I think it had uh, urine culture, lepto testing. Um, and then uh, 40x test, but I don't believe it had Bartonella testing specifically. But I'll have to go back and, and dig it up. But my my memory suggests that it's it did not. Okay, I was just curious. We I might be able to get those tests. That's if you had serum from the dog, I might be able to get that run out of interest for free. I don't know. Sure, I I likely have um, have blood still saved, so um, I can look into that certainly. Okay, I'll check with Ed. Okay. The three paragraphs about treatment, the first paragraph emphasizes the importance of treating the un underlying disease effectively. Uh, the second says definitive treatment recommendations for the crescentic form of post-infectious GM, and of course that would be perceived as the most aggressive and, and um, uh, most severe form, are not available. Anecdotal experience with glomerular complications of endocarditis suggests that corticosteroid therapy, cyclophosphamide, or plasmapheresis have a favorable effect on kidney function. Such observations are uncontrolled. However, they suggest that the prognosis of post-infectious crescentic GN is not necessarily disastrous when an aggressive anti-inflammatory and possibly immunosuppressive regimen is used after achieving eradication of the infection. So, uh, you know, it's they, 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 they fly by the seat of their pants, too. Great case. Um, I'm going to leave you guys, so uh, I'll bid you adieu. Safe travels, okay. George, wherever you're going. Um, so I think one other thing, though, J.D., I would keep in mind is that um, with the, the, the possibility that there's a lot of activation of C3, that this could be a dog that has a complementopathy. So some of those could recruit us. So I would, I think, continual monitoring, even though he's doing great, just always keeping an eye on the UPC, um, because if there is another bout of something and, and these humps are due to a problem with the complement system, uh, you know, an inherent defect in the complement system, and that's why this dog makes humps, um, I would just track it just, just in case something comes back. Because that's kind of what happens with these C3 patients is that every time and in humans that once they get an infection this goes crazy 
and then they start to have uh, glomerular disease uh, um, re uh, again. So um, I would just watch it. Yeah, we've prepped the owners that, and I usually tell any immune complex GN um, patients, owners that, uh, you know, we're, we might, we're usually not sure what the etiology is, and I would say most don't have relapses if we're able to get them into remission, but that's, it's always possible for sure. So um, they're so thrilled just to have their dog back right now that they're, they're definitely on top of things. The dog's biggest problem right now is it actually has a partial cruciate tear from running around the backyard too aggressively. So that's the dog's biggest uh, life-threatening complication. Well, that's really good news. So we'll transition from the good story after about a half an hour to the really crazy sad. St well, yeah, sad story. Do you wanna? Do we wanna move on to the next case? And, um, is that okay? That's fine by me. Unless uh, okay. anybody's in their questions or thoughts. Okay, I don't see anything on the little chat. So um, and looks like um, a lot of people have been able to join. So. Um, our second case for the day, and actually, have you, um, JD, just before I forget, have you spoken with not, um, uh, uh, Navid about a case that's very similar that he has? Uh, yes, I have. Did he tell you about a case? Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah I talked to him about his case, too. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Um, okay, this uh, second case is, let's see, it is a... Um, about five and a half year old uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, male neutered. Um, previous history of having syringohydromyelia, diagnosed about three years prior via an MRI. Um, earlier in uh, several months ago, so at the very end of November, the dog had a septic abdomen uh, due to a intestinal foreign body that was treated. Um, was sent to surgery, had um, biopsies of the uh, GI tract obtained. There was um, a part of a pine cone that was found within the, uh, the GI tract that had, uh, had perforated so it was a septic abdomen. He was treated for that disease. On uh, postoperatively, the dog developed significant hypoalbuminemia, as many septic abdomens may do, and was administered um, human serum albumin. And that was on the 29th of November. Um, I, as we're talking, I'll confirm the dose because I think there was, um, there also could have been a concern that the dog was given an inadvertently excessive amount of human albumin. But regardless, it received human albumin on the 29th. Um, dog actually recovered and was able to be discharged from the hospital maybe a day or two later. Came back in about two weeks after that for being a taxic, lethargic, and was found to have petechiations. Um, blood work showed that there was a pretty profound anemia at that point, 15% a neutrophilia and leukocytosis of 21,000. Platelet count was actually normal. The dog was now found to be uh, azotemic with a BUN of 91, creatinine of 2.8, hypoalbuminemic with an albumin of 1.8 at this point. Um, the dog also had um, uh, cutaneous lesions that were most um, suggestive of a vasculitis. Um, I'm trying to see how the skin was described. Uh, let's see. There was mild edema and erythema of the muzzle. Um, there was a bruising on both pelvic limbs and what was thought to be uh, either petechiation of the ventrum or um, some type of uh, cutaneous hemorrhage within the, uh, the ventral skin as well too. The dog was managed uh, conservatively uh, was, uh, with fluids. It was given antibiotics. It was given steroids, I believe, because of concerns of vasculitis. And uh, despite several days of hospitalization, the dog just was clinically doing very unwell, was very uh, dumpy, was really not interested in food, and the owners elected euthanasia. Certainly with the new onset of the azotemia and the skin lesions, we were suspicious that this could be a hypersensitivity reaction to 
the human albumin that was administered. And after the owners had euthanized the dog, they did um, consent to us to collect skin biopsies and we connect, collected uh, kidney tissue to submit for uh, uh, histopath evaluation. And you can see from the, the table that Rachel has up that the UPC was, was not terribly impressive. It was only about 1.6 at the time that it was uh, hospitalized, but the albumin was quite low and the dog had a mild, uh, mild to not even really moderate, but a mild azotemia that was present as well too. Yeah, so we got this um, sample that came through um, uh, and it, we have um, wedges, or sorry, cross sections of the kidney and there's going to end up being somewhat of a similar repetitive story about the uh, hypercellularity of the glomerular tuft um, and that it is both in an endocapillary location and, and a mesangial location. I just want to point out um, at this kind of uh, overall mag is that we have a lot of these uh, intratubular casts and some of them have dense protein in them, and then some of them actually have uh, red cell casts in them. So like these right here are red cell casts. So um, we know we have some degree of glomerular hematuria. That's the only way that you can have those types of red cell casts. So some of the glomeruli, at least, are rupturing and releasing um, red cells into the tubules. So that's already a trigger there. And then also at this mag, as we're going along and looking at some of the vessels, we have a few, uh, at least this one particularly, that has fibrinoid necrosis um, at the um, uh, kind of surrounding the vessel with an associated um, inflammatory reaction. So this is um, a little bit more um, generalized inflammation than the previous case. Um, and then the other thing that's a little bit more striking also is the degree of interstitial hemorrhage. So whatever has hit this particular case didn't just hit the glomeruli, it's probably also um, hitting the peritubular capillaries. Um, and so uh, glomerular tufts um, are um, uh, hypercellular, as we said. There's uh, entire segments of peripheral capillary loops where you can't identify the lumen, um, and so it's hard to see uh, um, the GBM itself, um, especially using the h &E stain. Um, but that's a generalized uh, uh, issue throughout all of the glomeruli on the specimen. Um, so it's a diffuse process and it's a global process with this degree of hypercellularity. Um, these out here is probably a podocyte and he has multiple nuclei. Sometimes that happens. It's just kind of weird. Um, so uh, we'll move to a different stain that's a little bit easier to interpret. And we'll do that trichrome. So uh, this particular stain is of interest because we start to see a little bit of material in Bowman space. Um, again, the hypercellularity is quite prominent. Um, and uh, so um, the material out here might be indicative of a previous um, capillary rupture, and so that might be how we're getting a, a little bit of those red cell casts, so a little bit of fibrinoid necrosis of the, vas of the glomerular tuft. Um, and, uh, and then overall, the actual um, interstitial fibrosis is quite minimal. This looks like a, um, a, an acute injury to the tubular system. There is expansion between one space between the tubule and the next tubule, but all of that's due to edema and not necessarily due to accumulation of fibrin or fibrosis. So um, a lot of this is actually um, interstitial expansion because of tubular damage and, and interstitial edema. So it didn't look like, a, you know, an irreversibly scarred kidney. It looked like it was fairly acute. I'm trying to find that vessel with the fibrinoid necrosis again. And of course I can't find it. Ah, sorry if I'm making you guys sick. Oh, here it is. So um, out here in this particular vessel, um, I can't really see uh, the um, fibrin out here. Actually, is this kind of red material out here, and then we have all this inflammatory component. 
And I will show you my favorite thing, which is the PAS. Um, one hint for the aspiring pathologists in the room, which there apparently aren't any, um, is that the cool thing about this stain is, one second, um, so PAS will stain protein cast, but it doesn't stain the red cell cast. So if you're ever saying, I wonder if this is a true red cell cast or if I think this is a protein cast that I'm not really sure about, you'll be able to go to the PAS stain and say, oh, all of this here are red cells, and so because the PAS isn't staining it, it's got to be a red cell cast, whereas it will stain the protein cast simply pink. So a little trick for you guys to verify that they're true red cell casts. Um, and then the gorgeous glomeruli. Um, this one has a mitotic figure. I have no idea how. It even, it might be inside a capillary lumen. But that's strange. Um, so uh, the hypercellularity is quite still apparent. And but if you again look at this GBM, it doesn't look um, awful. Um, there are areas of arsenicia that would have scarred down. Um, but in general, a lot of the GBM is, is a fairly normal thickness. So this was more of a proliferative pattern um, compared to the other case that we had that had some segments of um, double conturation. Um, oh, here's another. That's very strange that we've caught this many mitoses. I wonder what that means. I didn't see this or notice this in the earlier thing. Hold on. That's a mitotic figure. That might be a mitotic figure. Who knows what's going on there? So, um, strange. Not sure what to do with that. Um, okay, so we've got a hypercellular glomerulus. We have you know, um, pretty good uh, uh, normal thickness of the GBM in most segments with only a few segments that looks like they could be remodeled. Um, and then you have a lot of the stuff going on in the tubular interstitial compartment. So um, uh, it doesn't seem like it's just hitting the glomerulus. It seems like it's hitting a lot of things. And I guess one other thing to note, and I don't know if I really highlighted it in my description on the report, JD, but a lot of times in many glomeruli, the hypercellularity is um, at least mononuclear, and it's probably due to endothelial cells um, and their hypertrophy slash um, proliferation, because I'm not seeing, um, in, in a lot of the glomeruli, I'm not seeing a lot of circulating polys. Um, it's a lot of um, uh, just uh, mononuclear cells, whether, the, whether or not these are attracted um, monocytes or lymphocytes, possibly, that are in the capillary loop. Or um, endothelial cells, I can't, I, I can't really discern. I just, I'm not seeing a lot of, of polys, at least in these few glomeruli I've gone over recently. So that's a little bit of a strange thing. R Rachel, w yep. wouldn't the combination of mitotic figures where you've seen them and this uh, mononuclear cellular kind of argue for the principal change being endothelial uh, cell replication and proliferation. Yes, that's what I think. What else would make mitotic figures where you've seen them? Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly what um, is uh, the, the process. I think I probably didn't emphasize that in the report, and so I'll probably have to go back and amend the report. But if we're looking at this particular one. Something has turned on these cells to have three my mitoses. I think this one's probably in the mesangial compartment, so maybe something has stimulated these mesangial cells to proliferate. Um, again, very strange. It's not um, anything I think I've ever bumped into, and so um, that's, um, that's interesting when you think about the concept of, uh, of a core biopsy. Um, I can scrutinize 20 glomeruli, and I can spend you know 15 minutes looking at every single glomerulus and making sure I'm not missing anything. But then when I get a cross-section, even somebody like me who looks at kidney all day long can be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you get tired after really 25 <laughs> or 30. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think I'll probably have to go in and, and reemphasize that on the report. Um, for the additional studies for this dog, um, uh, this was the EMs I originally brought up. And so uh, that's why I knew it was a, a different case than, than previous. Because again, we have, um, we have this uh, good kind of
kind of pretty good uh, glomerular based membrane. We do have material and cell debris in, um, in the lumen. My, it, JD, I did have a question about how long, how long after the uh, uh, mutinasia were these samples obtained? Was it immediate? Yeah, I think um, maybe the owner spent some time with the dog, but as soon as the owner left, we grabbed the dog and obtained the sample. So it was within an hour, I would imagine. Okay. Okay. So, um, and, and the, the fact that a lot of the photosynthesis processes have remained um, pretty healthy looking kind of does suggest that it, it's, a, it's a good, um, even though it's not five minutes, but it's still a pretty good quality specimen. Um, we have numerous nuclei in here, and some of them look like they have uh, granular material and like granulocytes, so it looks like they have little um, uh, granules within their cytoplasm, although the nuclei do not look like granulocyte nuclei, so um, they're more of a round nucleus. Um, but again, very hypercellular um, glomeruli. This is the reminiscent breast of the lumen, and this is all cytoplasm for this particular cell. Um, we kind of lost the endothelial fenestra, so uh, if this were within five minutes, then we would think that, and, and it very well may be a true lesion, but we always kind of worry that, there, that this is one of the first things to go during autolysis, is the endothelial cell kind of loses its fenestra and they kind of solidify. Um, but this is just constant throughout all the capillaries, um, where we have like pretty good podocytes, a pretty good GBM, and then everything hanging out here in um, the capillary lumen. Um, uh, this is definitely a granulocyte here because of our cytoplasmic processes and the shape of the nucleus. So uh, I wasn't really sure what to do with this, this particular case. Um, and we, um, I, I guess if one person were to argue that these could be, I mean, uh, this is possibly an immune or deposit. It's definitely electron dense material. Um, it gets hard to say right when it's at this neck region whether or not it could just be hyalinosis. Um, I would favor that it's an electron dense deposit, but it's hard to say. And then this might be a true electron dense deposit as well. But they aren't, this isn't a very electron dense deposit. It's not a heavy immune complex mediated disease where you're seeing immune complexes everywhere. The striking thing is just the degree of hypercellularity. Um, Okay, so we're back to the same glomerulus. Um, we were um, also wondering if there was um, uh, immuno, immune complex deposits, and so uh, based on IF. So as we didn't really see anything on EM, um, I'm not surprised that we're not seeing anything with um, IF. This right here, these are actually podocytes that have droplets inside their cytoplasm, so the IgG is only in podocytes, and I can just tell based on um, that it's limited within one cell and it's within um, Bowman space. So the IgG was relatively unimpressive. Um, IgM is always there. IgM is just um, a very sticky molecule. Um, it does have a little bit of granularity, but it's, it's not, um, it, it's always pretty much this, this degree or even stronger. Um, so uh, I'm not trustworthy of the IG, IgM. The IgA is completely negative. The C3 is here, and I think that this is what's kind of cool about this case is we do have these dots, um, and it, it is pretty granular. You can even see another glomerulus coming up here that has um, dots as well. Um, and in some areas, it gets quite chunky, so there is C3 activation, um, and that might be part of the reason we have this uh, proliferative component for the um, glomerular disease. But uh, that's the only one that's kind of staining strongly. See when Q is negative. And the lambda is almost just glowing. And everything is kind of glowing on the lambda stain. So um, it fit more with just kind of background stain. These guys are plasma cells. And the fact that the plasma cells are staining stronger than the glomerulus makes me uh, attributes a lot of this to the background. Um, all of these are plasma cells hanging out here. Um, and then the, the tubules themselves are also glowing. But it's, a, it's not a granular um, appearance. It's just this weird glow. So I don't really trust it. Um, so it ended up being just you know, a really marked proliferative um, glomerulopathy. And um, I'm probably have to, I will go back into the report and talk a little bit more about that, those mito mitotic figures. Um, 
I don't know what caused the, uh, the, the in the end, what caused this dog to um, decompensate, whether or not there was some type of immune reaction or uh, complement activation, and it caused endothelial damage that led to all this uh, mitotic index of the endothelial cells. It's a possibility. I've never really heard of that before. Um, we talk a little bit in human medicine about um, a lesion called endotheliosis, which is, sounds stupid, but it basically just means the endothelial cells are the main thing that are attacked or um, compromised in um, the kidney. And so you have really marked um, endothelial hypertrophy, endothelial hyperplasia, and that might be the, a better kind of uh, category for this dog that something, something kind of set off the um, endothelial compartment. And maybe that helps explain a little bit about the petechiation as well on the skin. Um, uh, uh, a biopsy of the skin and the lip, and both returned with evidence of perivascular, um, neutrophilic, and leukoclastic, leukoclastic vasculitis. Um, so the pathologist looking at the skin thought the differentials for the vasculitis that was observed could include a type 3 or immune complex reaction, a drug reaction, or idiopathic um, vasculitis. Um, but certainly in the samples that were evaluated, the, um, there was evidence of vasculitis in all samples that were submitted. And at least in the kidney, I'm not seeing incomplete, I'm not seeing definitive immune complexes. I'm not seeing, they're not large enough. Maybe they're so, I, I don't know if they're there. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what George thinks about this. All right. Well, <laughs> here I go. Um, sort of like the situation with post-infectious. As I hung out in, in uh, physician meetings and circumstances and whatnot, listening to them talk about what they did for a living, another category besides post-infectious that I would hear them spend considerable amount of time on were uh, lesions associated with various vasculitides, okay? And actually, one of Rachel's mentors, Charles Jeanette, is one of the leading authorities on this sort of thing. And and again, because we didn't, you know, I didn't rub elbows with canine or feline cases that sort of fit in this category. Uh, I, I heard what they said, and, and I, you know, and I've collected papers about it and a variety of other stuff, but I never delved into it in the same way that I have delved into the things we did see in. In, in dogs, but vasculitides and and, and they these in, extend to and include uh, a, a family of vasculitides that are anti associated anti cytoplasmic anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies and and that's again. Um, uh, associated with a, with a, a test for the presence or absence of such antibodies, but they're still, you know, not quite sure how those antibodies, if they participate in the um, in the disease in the process, how exactly they work, and and so uh, and and or at least they did didn't fully understand the pathogenesis of all of it at the last time I. Uh, listen to it, which was quite a while ago. But the the, the point being that there there are a whole family of diseases that are that are talked about by nephropathologists that that are associated with various vasculitides. I mean, it's a major component of what they think about, at least in some patients. Now, the next thing that I take, took away from much of that, and with diagrams is that Dr. Jeanette would emphasize the caliber of the vessel that was the principal target of the vascular injury. It's not, you know, it's sometimes it's arteritis, uh, Wigner's granulomatosis or something, I mean, ra rather big vessels. Uh, and other times in other, you know, at, the, at other parts of the anatomic spectrum, you know, very small uh, arterioles and things, and the leukocytoclastic um, vasculitis, I think that's what JD was saying, This the dermapath people were seeing in their 
thing is is part of the spectrum and but the, the and with with regard to the kidney going back to one of the things Rachel showed some of that interstitial hemorrhage which he said maybe uh, was reflective of capillary damage and I'm not disputing that it might be but it, uh, some of what she showed and maybe just because she was focusing on the glomerular was in, in peri capillary interstitium uh, that, that is near, excuse me, periglomerular interstitium uh, that is nearby. And of course, if there were a damage to a small arteriole near, but you know, not inside that glomerulus, it, you know, that the bleeding, the hemorrhage could dissect into interstitium around. So it, it, it could separate nearby tubules without necessarily having you know, bled between those tubules, I would think. So, you know, but I don't know. And 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 again, the uh, my uh, I, I don't know enough about all the possibilities with the various vasculitides to be, to expound uh, about them. But I do believe that that the cause of this dog's problem is a vasculitis, uh, and I don't understand vasculitis in uh, in people much less in dogs well enough to tell you exactly you know what happened in this dog and whether or not the uh, human serum albumin uh, contributed or triggered or otherwise or somehow it managed to happen you know while in a dog that had that but you know everything that not everything that happened after the, the that infusion necessarily was caused by it it could be just temporal action but I think it's the, the dog clearly had a vasculitis, and it it affected its kidneys as well as the rest of its uh, vascular system. And exactly what name to put on it and how to explain its idiopathogenesis is a mystery to me. And there are certainly other reports. I would probably say most of them are anecdotal, but you know, one of the biggest concerns with giving human albumin to dogs is the risk of um, vasculitis whether that's part of a hypersensitivity reaction or whether it's um, its own entity, it's probably difficult to tease out. But uh, I think that's some of the big concerns is that you could have a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, um, probably not an immediate hypersensitivity reaction unless the dog's previously been exposed to it. But it's not an uncommon scenario that is observed. I think um, it's it, when it's observed, it's often just attributed to uh, vasculitis. If there's cutaneous lesions, then maybe the patient receives some steroids if they're able to um, tolerate them and they're tried to be managed more conservatively. I don't know of many cases where we actually have tissue evaluation to look to determine what the etiology of those changes might be. But um, personally, I have not administered human albumin, but you know, speaking to our criticalists that tend to use it, um, you know, this type of scenario is exactly their big warning that they give to owners that um, could be an adverse effect of the human albumin administration. So I think it's certainly observed, um, the, the phenotype at least, but whether, uh, but exactly what the underlying cause and the pathophysiology of it is, I think we're still trying to understand. So one of the hopes when this case came through is that um, that I mean, I the the nephropathologist across the river, they do a human albumin as their every single time they run an IF. That's what their immunofluorescence is, just to know what background protein like levels. Like what you're going to see is a background, and then anything above that would be considered positive for an immunoglobulin. So they have a great IF for human albumin um, that they use you know, five times once each day. So we were hoping that if we had really good immunoglobulin, um, uh, evidence of immunoglobulins within the glomerulus, that we could ask them to stain for the albumin to see if they kind of co-localized and you had positive IgG and then positive human albumin in the same glomerular tuft um, in serial sections, then you could say, oh, you know, it must be an immune complex with, with the antigen being the albumin. So, um, I think what, what we've been spoiled with in, the, in, in generally in dog medicine and canine glomerular disease is that when we have immune complexes, they're quite large and you can see them very well in immunofluorescence and you can see them really well on, on EM, but 
you know, we just don't really have positive IgG, and so the IgG is not reacting to the albumin. I guess the IgM could be reacting and forming a complex with the albumin. That would be kind of weird for me, and not having any electron-dense deposits identified in the glomerular tuft. So, um, so I didn't ask them to do it, um, just because I like to keep my favors <laughs> um, available. Um, so, and even if we found human albumin in a glomerular tuft, um, I don't think that that, I mean, we know the dog has been administered that, so I don't know um, what that would tell us, per se. Um, so it's just a really weird case of where do we go from here. I mean, granted, the album might have started an immune reaction, but it just doesn't seem to be making complexes that are identifiable via microscopy. Um, the other thought I just really wanted to quickly say as we wrap up is with, Do with George's comment about Inca disease or um, anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic and, and the body, um, that those lesions do have, you know, fibroidary necrosis, but in general, they don't have hypercellularity. That's not usually a common feature, but they would have, you know, capillaritis and so peritubular capillary hemorrhage, and they might have um, an, uh, a vasculitis within the um, larger vessels of the of the kidney. But it's not necessarily um, a proliferative glomerular pattern. It's usually just fibroidary necrosis um, and crescents without a lot of hypercellularity. Um, but I completely agree with everybody here that something set off these endothelial cells and these mesangial cells to start um, uh, proliferating and get really large and really swollen and then also some degree of um, attraction of mononuclear um, cells as well. So um, I guess there are, yeah, I, I, and I don't know how, what the best way to um, deal with the, if these cases come across our desk in the future, other than just trying to um, um, accumulate them and see um, whether we can get more tissue from these dogs. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I don't know if anybody has other suggestions for things where we could go from here. I don't okay. have a specific suggestion about where we should go from here, but my, my final comment to sort of help sum this up is um, that I think we should, if we're smart, think about the possibility that diseases uh, that we see in dogs might have fundamentally similar pathogenic mechanisms to diseases that occur in people and, and have some similarities in their uh, clinical or uh, you know lesion manifestation thing without being identical, uh, so yeah. that um, w w and my um, personal <laughs> favorite example of that is indeed Alport disease in dogs. Okay, it, it, fundamentally, the the same basic problem with type four collagen abnormalities of, of GBM composition. Uh, and they have a lot in common uh, in ultrastructural changes and things. But um, the immunostaining for the, the collagens that do show up are not exactly the same in, in dogs as it is in people. And, and the clinical manifestation in people is principally renal uh, glomerular hematuria long before, well before the proteinuria. Whereas proteinuria is, the, is clearly the dominant initial abnormality. So there, there are similarities, and some of them quite uh, alike at, at certain levels, yet they're not identical. And so as we go forward seeing things we've seen for the first time and trying to figure out how they relate to the literature in experimental animals or in humans or a variety of other stuff, don't be tied to the idea that it's got to look exactly like the people or the animal model or that kind of thing in order to be going be, be something in the same fundamental category okay I agree um, so I think uh, if uh, for those of you guys that were joining just a little bit late Larry is going to send out um, a I think a multi multiple um, invitation um, for the rest, like I guess, uh, obviously it'll, it, it'll be the same third Thursday, um, same time frame, um, and so I think it'll be, but it'll probably be good for multiple months, 
Um, and then that way, if he can't attend, um, JD and Kathy, both of them have access to be the the leader. So they hopefully hopefully one of those three people can attend. Um, and then if for some reason we can't do it, that we'll we'll just we'll cancel. But there should there will be an email that you should flag and save in a specific place so that'll have the it'll have the invitation for multiple months. Um, and that way he can just check one thing off his list and not have to worry about doing it each month. Um, so look for that email. And if, again, if you have other people, we're going to add Sherry Ross to this list so she can start to participate. Other people that you think that need to be invited, um, I, I'm happy to add them on. Um, we've had some people that um, can only attend occasionally, which is um, whatever clinical um, uh, input we can have is great. Um, so just send me an email if there's other people you think that need to be invited. Um, okay, everything great. So thank you, JD, for presenting these cases. So much for going over them. Yep. I will talk to you guys later. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.